You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. I've had the time of my life, and I owe it all to you. That's all I know. It goes bum bum bum. Close enough. Hello, everybody. How are you doing on this fine day, evening, night, morning, whenever it is? You are watching slash listening to The Command Zone. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Wong. How is it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. We have a very special episode today and a very special guest. That's right. We have none other than Jacob Holloway. Woo! Say hi, Jacob. Hello. So, so, Jacob, yeah, you were recently on an episode of Game Nights. Has it come out at this point, Josh? It's come out. Oh, yeah. I hope you guys have all seen it. It was a, a heck of a game. And, Jacob, you really showed up, and you brought you brought the stuff, man. I was very excited. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you guys having me out. It was definitely a great opportunity, and I had a great time. Yeah, a really fun episode. If you have not checked it out yet, well, you can see it on our YouTube channel. It's probably the last video that came out before this. We're... Probably. As usual, doing things out of order, so we're not 100% sure on the timing, but I'm certain that the sh- episode has come out at this point. Um, Jacob, we're going to be talking about your deck today. Mm-hmm. What's what's it called? Anything you can do, I can do better. Ah. What a great name for a deck. An amazing name, yeah. <laughs> We've had some great names over the years. Josh's Stop Hitting Yourself deck, but I think this is actually probably top five for me in terms of deck names, so I love it. I like it a lot, but before we get into it, we're going to be talking about a lot of cards today, and you know what that means, guys cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. You're going to be buying magic cards anyway. All you have to do when you're buying them from Card Kingdom is add in the slash command zone uh, bit at the end, and you are now supporting the show by using our affiliate link. It's super easy to do, costs you nothing, and definitely helps us out. Yeah, it helps us a lot. And another thing that helps us out is if you support our other sponsor, which is Ultra Pro. They make all the playmats, deck boxes, card sleeves, a ton of awesome dice. They have things like relic tokens. Mm -hmm. They have these wall scrolls. Whatever your gaming needs, Ultra Pro has you covered. They help protect your cards and really bling out your battlefield. Again, by supporting your sponsors, you definitely are supporting us, and we appreciate it. Absolutely. And the final way to support the show is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, Jacob is a patron. That's right. We haven't shouted him out yet in an episode, but I guess he got He one got better, a pretty right? big <laughs> shout out on Game Nights. And uh, if you haven't heard, we're actually doing the same thing that we did for Jacob. Yes. The reason Jacob's here, which is we're doing another audition where you can have a chance to get a guest spot on Game Nights, just like Jacob did. Uh, hopefully, whoever we choose will be as awesome as Jacob was. I think so. They've but, they've got some shoes to fill. Correct. But you have to be a patron to enter. So again, patreon.com slash command zone is where you go and sign up. And there is a time limit on that. Uh, patrons will have all the information of yes. how to enter and what the time limit is. And not to... Uh, not to What's the word? Bury the lead. Um, bury the lead. Yeah, That's exactly there what I was looking forward. We, Squeeze the juice. We also, man, we have too many sayings. Paradox <laughs> engine good? What happened to Segway, man? <laughs> uh, we also call out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to Matthew Sneary. Matthew. You definitely rock. Yes, you rock. You are not dreary. You are sneery. All right. <laughs> Let's move right on to the main topic. Today, we are, of course, deck teching the deck that Jacob played on Game Nights. You can see it in action on the episode. But today, we're going to talk about what makes it tick, what makes it work. And Jacob's going to walk us through some of his favorite cards and interactions. So before we get going, Jacob, who are the two commanders that you have for this deck? Because this is a partner deck. Sure is. Um, the two commanders that I play in this deck are Ikra Shadiki and Ludovic Necro Alchemist. Very nice. So let's read those off real fast for those of you that do not know what these cards do. Ikra Shadiki, the Usurper, for three, a black and a green. You got a 3-7, big butt, legendary creature, Naga Wizard. It has Menace and the text. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you gain life equals that creature's toughness. And of course, they the have very, butt link. Yeah, bu- <laughs> <laughs> that caught me by surprise. <laughs> Gives your creatures butt link. Yeah, butt link. Um, and of course, the very important text partner, which says you can have two commanders if both of them have partner. Uh, so the second partner is Ludovic Necro Alchemist. One, a blue and a red for a one-four legendary creature, human wizard. It says at the beginning of each player's end step, that player may draw a card if a player other than you lost life this turn. This is interesting text, and I think people get a little confused when Mm -hmm. they hear it out loud. Basically, you control Ludovic. 
there's three other opponents, let's say, if one of them hits any other of them or deals mm -hmm. damage to any other of them in some way, then they will draw a card. At the end step. It yep. doesn't mean they can't deal damage to you, the Ludovic player. It just means they can't only deal damage to you. They right. have to deal damage to another opponent. Also, if you notice in game nights this came up, yeah. you can deal damage. One of your opponents can deal damage to themselves. As long as it's not their turn. Yes, because uh, they are an opponent of yours. Yes. And so by dealing damage or losing life themselves, they will trigger Ludovic and draw a card. So if you have an ancient tomb, uh, a pain land, a shock land. Yeah, very interesting text indeed. Um, now you have two commanders here that are filling four colors. We're missing white, of course. Uh, and notably, Ludovic also has a big butt. So he's going to have some nice butt link when Ikris Shidiki comes out. <laughs> you you know, Jacob, you had an interesting... It didn't come out in the episode of Game Nights, but you had sort of an interesting political way to use Ludovic that uh, you talked about to me. Do you want to share that? Yeah. Um, obviously, you want to try to get Ludovic out as quickly as possible. Um, my rule is with Ludovic, he's going to stay out on the board as long as I don't hit get hit. Um, I'd like to give a shout out uh, to my friend Travis who will always make sure to hit me for a minimum of 10 damage, uh, at which point Ludovic comes off the board. Ah, so you kind of nice. use Ludovic as like a carrot and a stick. Like, I'm going to leave Ludovic out here, and you, all you people can draw cards unless you're mean to me, in which case I will take away this cool thing from you all that you're right. using. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And this deck itself also has a very interesting core strategy, which is anything you can do, I can do better. So, Jacob, let's talk a little bit about this strategy and the goal of the deck. And you brought this deck to Game Nights for a very particular reason. So do you want to enlighten the listeners as to why that is? For sure. Um, this is something that I have tried to build since I got back in Standard at Gate Crash. Mm -hmm. I tried to build it with some Night Vale Spectres in Standard, and uh, that deck ah. did not do well, let's say that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just have always wanted to make a clone deck. I've always, like, enjoyed that type of effect in Magic. It's something that's very unique. Um, and I just found the four color pair that worked for me and two partner commanders that, you know, that did what I wanted it to do. And I just tried my best to put it together and I liked the results. Right. What, what is the upside of playing a deck like this? Um, the upside really is I can bring it into most play groups and not know what the play level is um, and be pretty well prepared. Right. So, you know, I know you always talk about the the how what's the power level of your deck you know one through ten you know i'll just say well it's whatever you guys are playing that's the power level <laughs> you know we'll just sit right down and play a good game of magic so normally when i'm going around columbus like this is what i bring to the table first if i don't know the play group yeah i really like that because clones are going to copy what my opponent's doing mm -hmm. and so i can't be more powerful by a lot than what you because i'm using your creature so right. and and most decks i'd say are equipped to handle the level that they're at so it really is like what Jason Alt would probably call a 75% type of deck, like the perfect example of it, because most of the cards in the deck are just using your opponent's tools. Right. Yeah, so I really like having a deck like this in your arsenal. It's pretty cool. It's also a great deck to open with, because I think it does that sort of subliminal thing where it pays tribute to other people's decks. Right. Like, hey, I love that creature. In fact, I love it so much, I'm going to make my own version of it. Uh, and I think it's very hard also politically to look at someone that did that and be like, well... Actually, that's kind of cool. Thanks. You know, it's it's a bit of a diversionary tactic, especially with a, a commander like Ludovic out there too, which is drawing everyone's cards. So big ups to you, Jacob. I think this is a great choice to bring to the Game Nights table. And again, watch the episode. It did some work. Yeah, it made for a crazy, crazy game. Yeah, One absolutely. of the more crazy games we've ever had on the show. Um, okay, well, let's go. Let's dive into the deck here. I think the first thing, and we've mentioned it many times, um, that our you know, we would assume are going to be in the deck are clones and creature copiers. Right. So there are some cards here that, you know, clone, obviously, if you guys don't know what the effect is, it's a card that enters the battlefield and becomes a copy of any creature on the battlefield. Notably, this gets around hexproof because it doesn't target a creature for the most part. Um, so the first card we have on here that I thought was particularly awesome was Altered Ego. And throughout Magic's history, we've seen many different clone effects, but Altered Ego is one that came in, uh, out in Shadows Over Innistrad. I'll read it now and we'll talk about it. It's X, two, a green, and a blue. And it's a creature shapeshifter, a zero, zero. Altered Ego can't be countered. And you may have Altered Ego enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it enters with X additional plus one, plus one counters on it. So four mana for a clone. I think that's about, on average, a good rate for what a clone costs in Magic. Yeah, it sure, has, you can have X be equal to zero. Yeah, exactly. You can just pay this for four and have it just be a straight copy. But if you have the extra mana to sink into it, 
not only are you, you're essentially doing what the name of the deck is. Anything you can do, I can do a little bit better. In this case, with plus one, plus one counters. Um, so what, 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 what entices you about Altered Ego? Um, I love big X spells. I love big swings like that in Magic. Uh, this is one of those cards that, you know, as you said, I'm going to play it down and you're going to have to deal with it. Oh, you may have a 2020, but I have your 2020 plus whatever counters I have. So, you know. Right. 2020, who are you playing with? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Big mana. Not to mention this also conveniently can copy a zero zero spell if it doesn't enter with plus one plus one counters. or Because I've seen sometimes like, oh, I want that. Oh, but it's just going to die as soon as it comes in. Yeah. And Alter Ego not being able to be countered. Also pretty good. I think that can't be countered as, is actually a, kind of a big deal. Especially I if mean, you're dumping all your mana into it. Think right? of the Game Nights game. We had a Kozilek uh, deck there. Yeah. And so Altered Ego would be particularly good in that scenario. Um, yeah, I like it a lot. This next one I actually like even better. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite cards of all time in Magic, by the way. It's Dax Duplicate. It's two blue and a red for a 0-0 zero, zero creature shapeshifter. But it's a clone. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it has haste Ooh. and dethrone. Ooh. So, wow. This is, a, this is a big deal. And the dethrone is what kind of gives it that uh, I can do better part. Right. Because you can swing at the person with the most life, and then it's got at least it's at least one power and toughness bigger than the original. Yeah, and not to mention putting haste on the creature. Like someone lays down a monster, and they're like, "Pass the turn." And you're like, "Oh gosh, I hope it doesn't get back to them with that blight steal or whatever it is." You're like, "You know what? I can copy that creature," and oh boy, it's coming in immediately because it has haste. I can't tell you how many times I've played this card in my Marchesa deck, and it has just ended the game or ended someone's game on the spot, which I, I you know, obviously a big fan of. Um, Dax Duplicate. Uh, again, I like also because you said you came back during Gate Crash, right, Jacob? Uh, yeah. So you'll find that a lot of the cards we're talking about today have actually come out in the more recent modern era of Magic, which is great because this deck also, for all intents and purposes, is going to be a bit more affordable because these cards are more recent. We're not going way back in Magic's history. I think actually they've really started playing with the clone mechanic more recently with cards like this. And of course, crazy cards like Experiment Crash. Now, before we talk about this card, why why is this card in the deck, Jacob? Well, the short version is Jimmy's I'm greedy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like when I started Absolutely. thinking about clone effects and things like that, I said, well, okay, well, obviously I want to clone creatures. Okay, well, give me lands. Oh, oh what about abilities? I started like looking around for cards to do abilities and I found Experiment Crash. I was like, this has to go in the deck. I was like, even if I don't have anywhere for it to go or if I'm not able to make it work, game time and sometimes it'll it will get stuck in my hand mm -hmm. or i'll play it out and i don't have any targets to put the plus one plus one counters on this is one of those pet cards that will never get thrown out of the deck just because it does something so cool it is very particular uh it's two green green blue blue for a legendary creature ooze mutant so you could make this your commander if you wanted it's a four six and experiment crush has all activated abilities of each other creature with a plus one plus one counter on it and you can also tap Experiment Cross to put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. We just talked about two clones that can have plus one, plus one counters on them. And notably, Experiment Cross can also put these tokens, uh, these uh, plus one, plus one counters on any creature on the board right. that it can target. So this means your opponent's creatures, and obviously you're already copying things. Why not have Experiment Cross do this thing where it can also grab abilities as well without necessarily having to copy the actual creature? That's one of the things I like about this deck, Jacob, is that you it'd be very easy to build it and the whole thing is just i'm going to copy everybody's creatures but right. you're thinking of like no i want to be able to copy anything that you people are doing yes yeah, yeah very cool um i think the next card is a card that you called your pet card do you want to talk about you know you, you said you love your two for ones i do do you want to talk about sahili's artistry yeah let's talk about sahili's artistry um, this card's won me a lot of limited games, by the way. Oh, it's broken. Limited, <laughs> yeah. See all these artistry, uh, four and two blue, choose one or both. Uh, create a token that's a car copy of target artifact. Um, second ability is create a token that's a car copy of target creature, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. You can um, choose the same thing, by the way, for each, uh, it, for both modes. Correct, you can. Um, especially, I mean, it's this is one of those cards that normally I'm gonna choose the biggest thing on the board and I'm going to choose the thing that makes the most mana. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a soul ring, a mana vault, anything that's just making a lot of mana that's an artifact, that's what I want. Right. Um, you know, and then taking a big creature. This is, this is. I know I said Experiment Crash was a pet card, but this is the real pet card of the deck. <laughs> um, it's also a star too, so you know. 
that that's great as well. Yeah, I mean, I love this card a lot. If it's an artifact creature, like I said earlier, you can actually just make two of that thing. But the ability to copy someone's artifact is, right, like a copy artifact, very famous card, very old card, but a little bit harder to get. And sometimes you just don't want to copy an artifact. Maybe there's nothing on the board that's of interest to you. But with Sahili's Artistry, you're getting an actual two for one. Only costs two more than your regular sort of clone spell, but you get a artifact could be in, like, imagine someone plays a Gilded Lotus, mm -hmm. and you get a Gilded Lotus and the next best creature on the board or whatever benefits your board the most. That just seems like a blowout in the tempo thing that, you know, this is one of the cards I think that could go on the cards you should be playing but aren't list. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just because it has so much potential. The, the the downsides are, I think, relatively low. There's almost always going to be a creature to copy and usually on the commander table some kind of artifact. But the upsides, oh, boy, you could make two blight steals out of this for instance boy that's scary yeah i like the tempo thing you mentioned which is if you think about it in a very modest case scenario you get a five two five drops a five drop creature and a five drop artifact that means your six mana got you two cards and 10 mana worth of stuff mm -hmm. that's pretty great and that's yeah. just modest you could easily up that to like 14 to 16 mana worth of stuff yeah, and uh, yeah, that's that's big game right now, there. Yeah, now you're cooking with fire. Yeah, so our next category that we have here, outside of just the regular creature copiers, is that we have cards that copy more than just creatures. And, uh, you know, again, this deck is anything you can do, I can do better. So one of the cards that, again, I was just like, wait, this is a great card. It's Psychic Intrusion. And it's three of blue and a black for a sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from that player's graveyard or hand and exile it. You may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. The the weird thing about this that I never knew is that you can actually look at their hand and be like, nah, I'm going to go to your graveyard instead and cast a non-land card from it. So the world's your oyster here. You have so many more choices, not just creatures only. Do you have any uh, famous copy targets with Psychic Intrusion? Because I feel like this is one of those things that just gets people sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't really don't exile something from somebody's hand uh, just as like a fair politics kind of thing because I'm always trying to stay on the right side because normally with this deck, I'm always the threat. Right. Um, so I don't exile from the hand unless we're getting towards the late game, but normally most people aren't going to play the cards back again from the graveyard. So I try to go for something pretty, pretty spicy in the graveyard. Right, and you can exile it. When, and just leave it exile, yeah, right? Yeah, just keep it's it in exile. It's possible to use it as a thought seize or something if you're playing it. Like, if you see Paradox Engine in there, yeah, right? it's just like, no, nope, I'll leave that in exile. Yeah, <laughs> or even if it's, you know, they're a graveyard deck, they have a key card in there, some kind of Life from a Loam effect, you need to get rid of it. Psychic Intrusion just snatches that out. I really like the fact that it also reveals their hand to you, so you get a good idea of what they're doing, what they're holding on to, and it can potentially grab something out of their graveyard, which... A lot, of, a lot of good upside here. I will say, now that I think about it, my wife does play a Planeswalker Super Friends deck. Oh. And I have stolen her Karn maybe once or twice with this card, <laughs> now that I think about it. That seems good. It is colorless, so you can cast it regardless, <laughs> even though you can spam Man of Any Color. But yeah, that's a that's a pretty good target, I think. Um, not to mention, that card, by the way, remains in exile, and you can cast it as long as it's there. So, yeah, for you don't have to cast it right then. You can yeah. just wait until... Yeah, you want to get like mana moment. drain or something for, oh with it. Oh my god! Just hold that over hold everybody's that head up? for the whole game. Oh my, no, no, no. That, Josh, we're not allowed to give you the microphone anymore. Um, now, of course, I also include Phyrexian Metamorph on this list. I think that does serve the same thing as Sahili's Artistry in terms of copying an artifact. Uh, I, I like this card a lot. It can be a creature. It can be an artifact. Again, it just gives you that flexibility, not to mention Phyrexian Mana. Yeah, it's only three mana, actually. three mana, yeah. yeah, actually. So it's one of the few three mana clones in here. Um, coming up. This is one of my favorite cards ever. It's Clever Impersonator. Yeah, this one's great. Oh, I love this card. It copies card. anything. Any, well, non-land permanents, yeah, yeah. but it could be an enchantment. It could be a planeswalker. It really could be anything. Two blue, blue, creature shapeshifter. It can enter the battlefield as a copy of any non-land permanent on the battlefield. Um, so again, I think the flexibility that you're including here is really important, right? Because you could be very linear with this deck and just be like, creatures only. And then you're kind of hoping that everyone's playing creatures that you want that maybe want every deck you know because you could be in the case where it's like hey if i was playing against your plus one plus one counter hapatra deck there's probably some targets in there that aren't negative that juicy yeah. yeah negative one counters in there because it's like well you know they're all synergistic with each other not so great on my board here but well clever. there's plenty of decks that just don't revolve around creatures right they right. just don't have a lot of creatures right you know? and so you don't want to be stuck in a situation where it's like well my deck doesn't function because it's waiting for you to play a creature <laughs> Clever Impersonator is like, you're going to play some kind of permanents that aren't lands, right? Yeah. You're going to have some stuff out. They're going to be artifacts, enchantments, planeswalkers, and this allows me to interact on a different axis than just creatures. 
It would also protect itself if it comes down as an enchantment, like very yeah. hard to remove in that case. Like what if you copied your own giant enchantment or maybe you copy another copy of something you made earlier? <laughs> lots of lots of possibilities there. Um, and this next card is a card that I've talked about a lot but uh, do you want you want to describe what this is? And I would love to know if you've had some great times with this card because I honestly I talk about it so much I have yet to actually use it and really maximize its effectiveness. It's a Mirage Mirror. It is, and it's a great card um, for three mana. You pay uh, it's activated ability. You pay two, and Mirage Mirror becomes a copy of target artifact, creature, enchantment, or land until end of turn. That's so many things. And this was actually one of the ones that. Because uh, I hang out in the Discord that was recommended to me by one of the patrons. Oh. So I jammed it in there, and I have never used it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there are some combo-tastic things you can do, and they they pop up according to sometimes what your opponents are doing. Mm -hmm. Because you can stack triggers with Mirage Mirror, where like you activate it twice, right. and then it becomes one thing. And while it's that thing, you activate it, and then it becomes the other thing. I've seen people do yeah, some crazy stack, yeah. nutso stuff with it. And the great thing I think about this card is you can MacGyver those situations based on what your opponents have played and like do some pretty cool things. I've definitely, right. yeah. So, right. Let's say there are two things on the battlefield, a land, there's a guy's cradle and I don't know, a man of vault. Man of vault wouldn't work, but like the salt monolith would work, right? Because it's right. paid three to untap it. So the guy's cradle, you turn it into that. First, you tap it for mana. Then it becomes a salt monolith. You use the mana to untap it. And tap if it. you've stacked a few triggers, it turns back into the guy's cradle. Tap it again. Oh, gosh. And then you use the mana to basalt monolith. Yeah, you'd have to stack a bunch of triggers. But that idea yeah. works with this card. And, you know, that's I think that's worth putting into a deck like this anyway, of just the fun of having it out on the battlefield and constantly being like, what cool thing can I do with it? Yeah. Enchantment, creature, land, artifact. That's a lot of stuff and also notably we've been talking non-land permanence for a lot of the other cards this is one of the few things i think in magic's history now that can copy a land that yeah. has this flexibility right there are, you, have, there, you have like vesuva few, and stuff but yeah that's as been far sage as, and, yeah yeah the only downside is that it sort of reverts back to the mirage mirror at the end of turn but this even dodges that can be a plus side for sure yeah yeah, yeah. this this even dodges you know artifact removal uh, a vandal blast you just turn it into an enchantment or a land you know yep. there's a lot of ways this thing can protect itself which is really neat too one of the reasons that since he's divining top is so good all right well this next category i really really like because the top three cards in it are some of my favorite and this <laughs> is the the ability to copy non-creature spells uh the first three are all basically forks. Right. Spell Twine, Twin Cast, and Reverberate. These spells are way underplayed, and they just have a tendency to get people. Yep. I guess, sorry, Spell Twine, I misspoke. Twin Cast and Reverberate is what I'm talking about here. Spell Twine is something different. Um, this is the ability to take a spell that somebody else has cast or you've cast and copy it and cast it yourself. Reverberate it. Buck back at something else back at the the spell that ca that it's copying it basically it, you know in red this is how you can play counter spell by the way yep because yeah. you take control of their counter and or not take control of it you copy it and then counter their counter with your counter that you just made with your your twin cast or whatever yeah so a lot of flexibility there and then spell twine it costs a little bit more at six mana but you can exile a instant or sorcery from your graveyard and an instant or sorcery from an opponent's graveyard and you copy both those costs, and you cast them without paying their mana costs. Hey, so, wait a minute. Spell Twine is Sahili's artistry for spells. Oh, in graveyards, right? Yeah. Right. Kind of. Has to choose your own and someone else's, but that's still six mana to get two things, essentially. I mean, th this is a big game here, right? Like, you can copy anything. Like, think about the number of times where it's like, I don't have a board wipe anymore. I used it. <laughs> uh, did you? Did you? <laughs> can I, I'll use it again. Yeah. Have you, have you had any... What do you use Twin Cast and Reverberate, the fork variants, mostly for? Are you protecting your own stuff? Are you just waiting in the wings for something huge, for somebody to cast something awesome? Yeah. A little bit of A, a little bit of B. Um, it depends on what type of decks that I'm normally playing. Um, but if I know that somebody's like just playing, like say I'm playing like a, against a, any of the Niv mizzet decks that are playing a ton of incident and sorcery spells, I'm definitely going to hold one of these up right. and try to, you know to piggyback off of their sweet cast. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, sometimes you can also path two things at once, right? Something, someone paths a creature, you're like, you know what, I we have to get rid of multiple threats. I can't tell you how many times in the game where it's been like, how do I how do I even begin to fathom how to deal with all of these things at the table? And, and I was, someone's like, I can deal with one thing. And it's like, all right, but is that enough? So I think Twin Cast Reverberate have that ability to really clear things up, not to mention play a good political game there too. And don't forget, 
you can fork your own stuff. So if you right. cast a spell twine, oh and you gosh. can cast two spell twines. <laughs> or we know from Game Nights that uh, Villainous Wealth is in the deck, and we're going to talk about it in a minute here. Sometimes yeah. you have a certain amount of mana, it actually, you're going to get more stuff right. by forking your Villainous Wealth. Would rather you rather, than, yeah, would you rather have two Villainous Wealth for seven or one Villainous Wealth for nine? Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, totally. Something to think about. Um, this next card was on a recent episode of Cards You Should Be Playing But Aren't. Yeah, and it actually reminds me a bit of uh, uh, Psychic Intrusion, but it's Gaunti, the Lord of Luxury. And doesn't it feel luxurious, Jake, when you copy something that someone else has or you cast it from them? Oh, it sure does, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can look and cast at cards. With, when Gandhi enters the battlefield, he basically looks at a opponent's top four cards, and then you exile one of them face down, which yep. I like a lot, by the way. The secret... They is, don't even know what, what yeah. card it is, yep. Yeah, you put the rest of the bottom of their library in a random order, and then, again, you can look at, cast that card, and pay Anna as though it was mana of any color to cast it, even if Gandhi dies. So I really like this kind of effect. It's the sort of thing that alongside Twin Cast and Reverberate really can get people and just pull the, you know, pull the, what is it, pull the rug out from under them? Yeah. Pull their luxurious throw rug out from under them. The rug that really tied the room together? Yeah, it really tied the room <laughs> together, dude. And then someone happened to, yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next card, which is one of my personal favorite Ugh, cards. This and is my least favorite card, I, I think, in the game. <laughs> I'm just glad that I found a kindred soul who also appreciates the par perplexing chimera. Oh, gosh, don't don't give them more fuel, Josh. So, is this one of your favorite cards, Jacob? Please say it is. Oh, it is. Oh, without a doubt. All right, my man. Wow. So it's a five mana three three chimera. But what it does is when it's on the table, it any, stops the game. That's what it does, Josh. <laughs> it literally stops the game from happening. Any spell that gets cast, you can choose to trade your perplexing chimera for that spell basically so Ugh. i've got perplexing chimera it goes to jimmy he casts a spell doesn't matter what it is if i want it he i go here you have a perplexing chimera and now i take your spell and wow. if it's a creature that creature comes into play under my control if it's uh he played i don't know blatant thievery then i steal the stuff if he cyclonic rifted i cyclonic rifted yeah yeah the only thing that that doesn't work with is board wipes because if you take control of a wrath of god it's it still, still destroys all yeah. creatures um but the thing that's interesting and people don't think about is that once i do that jimmy has a perplexing chimera yeah and now Dang. he can do that to everyone else yeah that's kind of nuts because the thing about this card josh how often are you able to trade a creature for an instant or sorcery like right. that's such a weird bizarre perplexing exchange <laughs> that we just found it just creates these awful board states where no one wants to do anything. So, Jacob, please enlighten me uh, as to why I should be playing this card. Well, listen, it's, first of all, the way that people react in different playgroups are different. I will say that. True. Uh, the way you guys reacted where you guys like, well, I'm not playing anything until we can get rid of this. Well, my playgroup actually t takes the plunge head first into chaos. Oh, yeah. And they will like, yeah, because, I mean, the thing is, once I give up the perplexing chimera, the thing is, then I have to worry about the perplexing chimera in this deck, I don't have a way to get it back. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so the, now the shoe's on the other foot. And right. yeah, I think that's a good way to play it too, which is like, oh, I'm just going to cast something into this. If you want to steal it, then I'll steal the next thing somebody casts. Right. And like, we'll just go down the list here and see who comes out ahead. Uh, for me, I just don't even want to dare the person, right? I don't even want to be like, do you want this? I just would rather let someone else take that first hit. <laughs> I think that's the first hit, right? It's like, no one's in the pool because they all think it's too cold. But the first person that steps in, it's like, all right, fine. It's warm enough. Let's all go in. But you, after that, you have a perplexing chimera. So. Yeah, and you're wet in the pool and you're cold. <laughs> and no one likes you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. wow. No thanks. This went deep into Jimmy's childhood somehow. I, I don't know what we're, happened. It's the full id of me now. <laughs> okay, well, we've got some more uh, categories to move on to here. Some more of the deck to delve into. But before we get into that, we are going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. Hey everyone, today's episode is brought to you in part by Audible, one of the top providers of audiobooks online. The service is great. You get access to an unbeatable selection of bestsellers, memoirs, thrillers, and more. Yeah, if you can think of it, there's a really great chance you're going to find it on Audible. Members get to choose three titles each month and also get access to exclusive fitness programs, which you know we're both big fans of here on the show. You can listen on any device, anytime, and anywhere. Look, you're already podcast listeners, so a service like Audible 
Audible is a no-brainer and signing up is easy. Head on over to audible.com slash command or text the word command to 500-500. Easy as that. So recently, I've been re-listening to the Stormlight Archive books from Brandon Sanderson. If you didn't know, he's a huge magic fan, a magic nerd just mm -hmm. like us. This is something I find Audible to be particularly great for, and that's getting a quick refresher on earlier novels in a series before the next installment comes out. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to audible.com slash command or text the word command to 500-500 to sign up today and make that drive time commute a little more enjoyable. Or, you know, if you're like Jimmy and I, it can make your work time sometimes a little bit better too. Yeah, that's right. Oh, of course, <laughs> do all of this after you're done with this week's episode of The Command Zone. Oh, right. Yeah, finish that first. Okay, well, speaking of which, let's get back to it. All right, we are back talking about Jacob's deck, the good one, the best one, anything you can do, I can do better. Now, we talked about cards, non-creature spells mattering in this deck, um, but I think we're kind of missing what I like to call just the, nah, I'd rather just steal it. Just give it to me. And one of the most impactful cards, I think, probably, it's up there with Expropriate. It's up there with game-ending spells. It is Blatant Thievery. Jacob, you want to read this one out so everyone knows how, uh, just how dis 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 disgusting it is? Sure. Uh, it's four and three blue. It's a sorcery, and for each opponent, gain control of target permanent that player controls. Seven mana up to three permanents. You're going to get three things, because they're going to at least have lands. Yeah, and you get to choose. It's not up to them, uh, as long as it doesn't have hexproof. So if you think about it this way, if it's seven mana, right, for three things, divide that amongst three players, you're basically ca you're, you're, you're stealing something for about two and half a blue, right? So it's like, that's... That's nuts. It, no way are you not getting way more than seven mana worth of stuff. You're stealing the best thing everybody has. Yeah. I mean, probably. I, you like to play the politics game a lot, Jacob. So I could see you negotiating with one player and saying like, okay, uh, if we can be friends, then I, I won't take your best thing. I'll take your worst thing or something. Right, right. Oh, of course. That that always happens. I mean, I, I don't want to play Arch Enemy on the table. I will if I have to, but I'd rather, you know, have a nice partner and in crime and, and do what I can. I mean, do you find that it's better to not be as aggressive with your stealing spells or, or maybe save them in your hand till when you absolutely have to sort of press the button and, and sort of play out your weaker clones and play that game first? Have you found value in that in your play groups? Oh, for sure. There's a reason why most of the steal effects are above like six or seven mana. They're definitely for later game. Right. Um, and just for closing the game out. Because after after we've made friends, you know, you know, I only want to make enemies at the at the end of at the end of the game, right before right before they die, we oh. we talked about uh, we did an episode based around the the prince, the Machiavellian right. um, uh, manuscript, and one of the quotes from it, and I'm going to butcher it a little here, but was basically like, a man will more quickly forgive like the you killing one of his family members than you stealing stuff from him. Right, and so stealing things from people is among the sort of top tier of things you can do that's going to make them angry if you don't do it right yeah and so i i like that it's really smart you've you've you, you are going to steal some things that's the type of deck it is but you know that that's more of a near the end of the game play and maybe you're, there's no coming back from uh from that politically with certain players right and and that does tie into this next card very well and that at some point you do have to become the villain if you're going to want to end out the game uh if you guys watched game nights i don't want to spoil it for you but this card does make an appearance it does some appearance. stuff it does some stuff <laughs> it is small appearance yeah you know x whatever you want it to be it is a villainous wealth one of bdm's favorite cards he jeremy noel jeremy noel yep. yep as well oh, that's right that's right it is x black green blue for a sorcery Target opponent exiles the top cards, X cards of their library. You may cast any number of non-land cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them without paying their mana costs. What do you think is an acceptable number for X to use this spell at? Um, at a, at a minimum, seven mana. Seven. Yeah, seven cards, yeah. Seven for X, yeah. Because you don't want to hit, first of all, you don't want to hit like a huge spell that you couldn't cast. Right. And second of all, you if you're only going four cards deep, what are the chances of getting a four drop too? Right? Yeah, you might. Yeah. You're just too easy to whiff totally if you're not up around seven. But I mean, I'm assuming you've cast this sometimes for you know, fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe fifty. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. This card only gets better. It's like a fine wine. It can only get better the higher you cast it. Sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, like for instance, that first clone we talked about, Altered Ego, right? If you cast that for a huge amount, what do you get? You just get a bigger creature out of it. Right. Sure, it's more intimidating, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't scale in the same way, right? In the same and, way. And 9-9 nine, nine versus 7-7, seven, seven, eh, there's yeah. not that big of a difference. But nine cards, including nine CMC spells, or 11 cards and 11 CMC spells, or eight cards and eight CMC spells, right? That's just much better, and you have a higher chance of hitting them the further down you go. And there's always going to be some opponent that is juicy here because it's not just creatures, right? It's non-land cards. So you you definitely get a big whopper out of a, a, a value out of this card usually, which I'm a, a big, big fan of. Yeah, really cool card. Uh, I also think this doesn't even fall under the category of stealing people's stuff to the same degree. Right. This it's is just not stealing game, something. Right? Well, it's not stealing something off their battlefield. So I think they get kind of less angry about it. You're casting their cards. You have it, but you didn't take it from their hand or from the battlefield. Right, right. It, I mean, it's almost like you had the same cards on your deck and you played them. I don't think this kind of qualifies. Now, usually they want to kill you after you villainous wealth because your board has a million things on it. And it's their stuff. Well, yeah, but I don't think the fact that it's theirs is as big a deal. True. It's more just everyone looks at you and goes, uh, can we... We got to do something. We all this. need to yeah. do something about this immediately, <laughs> right? Um, and one more uh, I'd rather steal it card is Dragonlord Silumgar. Uh, you mentioned that your uh, significant other has a Planeswalker deck. And there aren't that many cards that affect Planeswalkers. And Dragonlord Silumgar is a six mana flyer that can steal a creature or a Planeswalker as long as you control the Dragon Lord. Uh, so pretty good here. Uh, she stole Tassiger in the art, which is one of my favorite parts about this card. Just took him. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Tassiger. My Tassiger. Well, Tassiger um, thought that he was running the, uh, it's not the guild, it's the Wedge. The, yeah, yeah wedge. the Wedge. wedge. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. The Sultai Wedge? Yeah. I believe so. Yeah, not sure, not sure. It's a Wedge. Okay. Um, the next category we're going to talk about here is this is the this is sort of the second part of the name. It's let's all let's all do something, but I'm gonna do it better. Right. Yeah. And so well, the first card we have is Collective Voyage, and it has a a line of text that we don't often see in our play group much at all. But it's Join Forces, and this card only costs one green as a sorcery. So Join Forces, starting with you, each player may pay any amount of mana, and each player searches their library for up to X basic land cards, where X is the total amount of mana paid this way, puts them on the battlefield, tapped and shuffles their library. So you could technically play this for just green and let everyone else pay the X and make it big, and then everyone's able to search it out, right? So for one mana, you could potentially be getting a lot more. And I noticed you do have 18 basic lands in the deck, so you are in a prime position to take care of this. Josh, his decks, maybe not so much, because you don't have too many basics in there. Yeah, I have barely any in some of my decks. Since yeah. A couple have, like, literal zero. Um, How have you found that this works out in your playgroup, Jacob? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, one of the early lessons that I learned from this deck is that I can't play anything unless my opponents play anything. Ah. So... Yeah, so this deck kind of turned into like a deceitful group hug deck where I'm like, yes, please play your things. Please play your things. Because otherwise I have nothing to do. Yeah, I can't right. copy it if it's not there. So giving everybody mana is is good. Do they usually take you up on this offer? Like, does everybody usually pump in? Because everyone's getting the same amount. It's not like um, Tempt with Discovery or one of the Tempt cycles where like you get three you know, more than everybody get else gets. Yeah, yeah. This one is, and, and we're going to talk about Minds Aglow in a second. We can just throw this into the mix too, which is, basically this exact thing except for drawing cards instead of getting basics and putting yep. them into play and so yeah how do you find that the pl other players at the table sort of navigate this do they usually kick in or do they usually be like no i'm not gonna put anything into that the earlier the game they will um i know i kind of always do this thing where i'm like hey you know you may want to leave some mana open you know your next turn you know just kind of like throw it out there and people kind of start reading it oh oh okay because you know early game everybody's like, okay play i'm a soul ring okay i'm gonna play with mana door okay I, hey by the way leave some mana open we've got something really cool we're gonna do you know mm -hmm. and it and it also helps speed the game along too yeah not to mention i think you have better mana sinks than a lot of players in this case especially if you're trying to cast cards like blatant thievery which have villainous wealth or villainous wealth right <laughs> but blatant thievery has so many blue symbols in it right, right? Sure, so sure, being sure. able to fix your mana in a four color deck i feel like is also really important so this card just does kind of it all in your deck based because i didn't even think about right if your opponents can play bigger stuff then you can copy them and at a better rate they spend seven mana on an elish nor and you only spend four to get the same creature yeah true true i would be wary of giving a bunch of like what if it's seven or eight that means the player going next just has a huge advantage 
hey, but hey, you're going to have that same advantage when it does roll right back around But it to might you. not make it to you if you give somebody an extra seven mana. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, but Jacob's right, right? The earlier in the game, the yeah, better here. Yeah. And again, you have 18 basics in the deck, so you're going to be able to find a lot of these. I, I think a lot of players, if he gets up to six or seven, would fail to find in certain decks, in certain play groups. True, especially since they probably already have some lands out, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this next card, which we have talked about many times on the show, so I'd like to get your take on it, Jacob. It's Tempt with Discovery, three and a green for sorcery. It has Tempting Offer, which is search your library for a land card, you put it onto the battlefield. And then each opponent may search their library for a land card and put it onto the battlefield. For each opponent that does this, you also search your library for an additional land card and put it onto the battlefield. So, Whoa. by the way, it's land. It's not basic land. It also doesn't come into play tapped. It comes into play untapped. untapped. So... This is often used to get like broken type of combos, like Cabal Coffers and Urborg type deals. Um, so people are can be wary of it, depending. Jacob, what's been your experience with Tempted with Discovery and and you know how people play with it? Have you found it to be worth it? Uh, it is in my play groups personally. They know that I'm not going to do anything degenerate with Tempted with Discovery. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm with a new group for the first time. I may only get like one person to bite, even if I like swear up and down that I'm not, you know, going to get like a dark depth or anything crazy like that. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, people do play Expedition Map in their decks just to find out one land. So honestly, Expedition Map costs three mana total to play and activate. This costs one mana more and you do get that land and it is untapped. So technically it could cost three mana based on the land you get out onto the battlefield. So this is one of those cards, I think, where unless your opponents, you know, Let's say they have a Cabal Coffers out and you're like, crap, they're going to find Urborg with this. I mean, that's like the most dangerous scenario you could be in is if someone else is going to benefit a live out. But in that case, you do get two lands. But I don't know. I, I, I want everyone to play Temple Discovery. I think it, it definitely speeds up the game every time I, I've seen it played. Yeah, I think it... it we, and we're probably partially at fault. It's less good now because I think if you only get one land, it's not very good. I think if you get two, though, on average, it becomes good. And if you're getting three or more, it's it's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're not doing broken stuff, if you're just going to get oh, like... yeah, four mana for four untapped lands. Even if it's just two bounce lands or something. Remember, it's right. any land and bounce lands kind of draw you a card. Um, so getting something like that. I mean, I'm not even talking about Guy's Cradle or Sarah's Sanctum or whatever else, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a good card depending on how your playgroup reacts to it. Right. Um, all right, next category we have is Graveyard Copiers. We have a couple of cards we just talked about here. Uh, the first is Beacon of Unrest, three black, black, and put target artifact or creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control, and then you shuffle Beacon of Rest, Unrest into its owner's library. So again... So you're stealing something, a creature or artifact out of out of an opponent's graveyard, or it can be your graveyard. From too. a graveyard, yeah, yeah. right? And so I'm always, whenever I look at cards that target graveyards, one of the things I always look for, and I'm sure Jacob in this deck you did the same, is cards that can target any graveyard or isn't limited to just one. Because as a copy deck, right, you're constantly playing the odds of whether or not you're going to have something to take and steal. And the more that's restricted to just opponents or just your own, that's going to be much harder for you in those scenarios when maybe a board wipe hasn't happened or there isn't enough stuff in the graveyard. So I do like the fact that you put Beacon of Unrest in here. Yeah, I definitely love the flexibility that this card has. Um, yeah, like you said, this is just one of those cards that, oh, sometimes I just want to play something from my graveyard that maybe somebody wiped, you know, maybe I got my chromatic lander wiped away. Okay, let me just get that back real quick and, and try to catch back up with the board or something like that. Right, right. Um, and then the other card we have in here is Grave Upheaval, which for a larger mana cost puts a creature from a graveyard on the battlefield under control. It gains haste, which is nice, but more importantly, has basic land cycling too. And if you guys remember, this was in the commander set alongside a bunch of other mana cyclers. And they're all pretty good. They're all pretty good, right? Because at the very least, if you're, if you're choked on mana, you can pay to get rid of this card and get a basic land out of your deck so that you can put it into your hand and, and fix your mana colors. And it costs two colorless as well, so... Very good when you're able to have something that's just generic mana, has multiple uses on the card, and is very flexible. It has that haste thing, too. That's a, yeah. it's a, you know, haste is not something we highly prioritize in Commander. I've started to prioritize every it more time, and more. If it's gravy on something, it can be very, very good. Yeah, actually. Because you're using a thing right now, which is a huge difference than, like, hope you untap with it. Yep, very much so. Um, I put a fun little category in here called, hey, Lance 2. Uh, which is basically that you have some lands in here that also do the thing of copying other people's lands. Like Exotic Orchard, uh, it adds a man to your man pool of one man of any color that a land an opponent controls could produce. So you're playing a four-color deck. Seems like an automatic add and a flavor win. I mean, this should be in all three color and up decks. Yeah. You're, Just, gu you're guaranteed to get at least a couple of your colors. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Thespian Stage, uh, you don't have the Dark Depths combo in here, but I do like the flavor of Thespian Stage, which for two mana, you can tap it and become a copy of any land. And then you gain the ability again. I love cards that can do this, because again, flexibility, you're able to use it more than once potentially and change it to fit your, uh, you know, whatever's going on in your side of the table. I could see this being used for like an Urborg if you just need more black mana, for instance. Well, if they've got Urborg, you have Urborg already. Oh, that's a good point. Cabal Coffers. <laughs> I meant <one>. Cabal Coffers, <laughs> yes, if they have Urborg. Don't listen to me. Um, oh, right, and then the last card here is Restore, which is actually a card that I haven't seen too often. It's an uncommon from the Commander set of 2013. One in the green sorcery, put target land card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So it's kind of like rampant growth, right? If it is from a graveyard. I've yeah. seen it in like the Lord Windgrace Gitrog decks. Mm -hmm. I hadn't actually seen it in a deck where it was trying to sort of get an opponent's land from the graveyard and, and use it until uh, you used it that way, Jacob. Usually it's in those dedicated land decks that yeah. know they're putting their own lands into their graveyard. But imagine you're getting a fetch land, right? Good chance it's going to yeah. be able to find one of your lands in your four colors. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, strip mines are going to go there and things oh, like gosh. that. So, yeah. That's a good point. All right, let's move on to my my favorite topic or subject area of expertise. Well, maybe not. I don't win that much. It is winning, though. So, so win cons? Win cons. Jacob, you want to talk about this first one? Because I'm a big fan of this card. It's Biovisionary. Yeah, it seems tailor-made for this deck. Yeah, right. D same DJ would be very happy that you have this card. I think so, too. In the same way that I put Azur's Elocutors in my stacks deck, I think <laughs> I think Biovisionary fulfills that role for this deck. Yeah, the deck has... Um, this is basically the only thing that doesn't fit the rest of the form of the deck. <laughs> so Biovisionary reads, uh, one green and a blue for a 2-3 human wizard, and at the beginning of your end step, if you control four or more creatures named Biovisionary, you'll win the game. Very silly text on Magic Cards. Jacob, usually. have you ever won the game with that alternate win condition? <laughs> Man, I was so close. I, I, I even know the time. Ah! I even know the time when it happened. What happened? And shout out to my friend Brian. And he, like, caught it right before it happened and, like, shut the whole thing down. No. But, yeah, I was, I was very close. I just snuck the BioVisionary out really early and just kept him on board and then had a progenitor mimic. And then I just slowly started, was about to win, and he just shut everything down. It's really sad. Ah. Really sad. <laughs> I mean, I think cards like you had a stunt double in here, which has Flash as a clone. Those yeah. are the kind of cards that really are effective um, for helping you get to a Biovisionary win. But you I have to get, you have to like hop the the timeline. Yeah. So everyone's like, oh, we got two turns. Oh, we got one turn. No, you don't. I do something that Whoop. you didn't see coming. Got him. Yeah. yeah. It's like flashing in Felidar Sovereign, doing yeah. that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's the closest I'll get to Coalition Victory and Commanders, so I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you also have uh, three interesting cards here. And, I, you know, I didn't think about this at first, but it made total sense, right? If you're going to be copying the biggest, baddest stuff from everyone's boards, you should probably use them to smack people in the face and win the game with them. So Beastmaster Ascension, Thunderfoot Bailoth, Stonehoof Chieftain are all cards that basically incentivize you to be attacking and turning your creature sideways and trampling over your opponents. They're, um, they're overrun type cards. Yeah, overruns. Um, and I mean, what's the effectiveness you found of this sort of stuff? Because, you know, I was looking through the rest of the deck and there are a lot of powerful cards in there like Villainous Wealth and Blatant Thievery. But I feel like sometimes you just have to get people to zero life to win. And this feels like one of the better ways of doing it. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you're copying big creatures, you definitely, like you said, you want to smack people in the face. Um, this category here is just all about making the things that I already have much better. Right. Um, obviously, giving them trample. Okay, you know, maybe I copied a 10 10 Eldrazi. Well, now it has trample and plus two plus two. Or now it's trample and indestructible. Or if I swing with enough creatures, then they all get plus five plus five. And even if I don't have trample, plus five plus five on a lot of creatures. That overruns a lot of boards very quickly. I mean, even just plus five, plus five on three creatures, right? That's 15 yeah. damage. Yeah. That's almost half of someone's life total. And by the time you're playing these cards or have Beastmaster Ascension trigger, it's very hard to come back from, I think. It, that's the number one thing I've found is the best way to beat someone that has a deck that's all about planning out a big turn, going to have a big impactful thing, and it's going to win, is that they are under so much more pressure if they're at six, seven life, yeah. right? They can't really loosen their defenses at any moment just because of the, the amount of power and the threat that your board would pose to them and, and other people's boards at that moment too. And of course, Rise of the Dark Realms. Yeah, it had to be in here. It had to be in here, right? This it's, is <laughs> it's the insurrection in black. It's, it's, it's grabbing everything out of every graveyard, throwing it on the battlefield at once. You get your clones back, you get to re-choose the targets for them, you get double the enter battlefield effects. 
this just wins games, right, Jacob? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, when my opponents see this coming, if nobody has an answer for it, um, and by an answer, I mean a counter. Right. Uh, counter spell. Because by the time I'm ha- I have nine mana, there's a lot of uh, creatures, uh, good creatures in the graveyard that are going to come back. And like you said, I'm going to get the, the end of the battle foot triggers, get a lot of good ATBs, and definitely cause some damage, affect the board state, and somebody's going down my next turn. Yeah, well, and some of your creatures do have haste, too, like we said earlier. Yeah, a lot of them, actually, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to be able to to definitely get in for some damage. So, yeah, I I, I like this deck a lot, Jacob. I I think big kudos to you for finding a deck that was able to muster up the power and the ability to be, you know, to hang with the Game Night's table or whatever, but specifically in a way that almost... It almost felt like it was made for the show, right? It was a very meta choice in a lot of ways, but I feel like this is just something that you created because it it helped you find your play groups and play games that are fun and also more balanced because of a deck like this. So, do you have any lasting impressions of the deck? What do your friends think about this deck? I'd love to know. Um, my friends love this deck. Um, just because it just does really weird things. I think my wife and my 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 best friend's wife, I don't think they're that keen on it cuz they they just don't <laughs> like the part where I steal their stuff. <laughs> um, but I will say, if you do ever decide to build this deck or pilot this deck, the thing is to remember, this deck is not good with the, all the tribal stuff going out. Um, ah. Yeah, I'm a toolbox kind of guy, so I build stuff that likes to have a lot of different win conditions, and tribal decks tend to be very linear and want a lot of the same thing. So unless you're just going to copy one player's stuff the entire game, it's right. not really going to work out for you. Their stuff's not that great for you to copy because you're not getting all the synergy they're getting. Right, right. Exactly. So, yeah, so you're getting like a 3-3 a three, three on the ground, but theirs is actually a 7-7 seven, seven because everything else is giving it plus 1, plus 1 or and something. It's pumping out elves every yeah. single time. Unless they're yeah. playing slivers, in which case, no, still bad for no, you. No, still bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love this deck because it's kind of, it's like judo, right? It's like take your opponent's, right. um, you know, wow. their energy and direct it to get back against them. I like that. And I like this idea of like, you can always bring this deck to the table and it's never going to be like a 10 in comparison to somebody else's five right right because you're just going to use their tools so yeah. it can't it can it's sort of always playable even if they've got a pre-con well i'm sort of playing with a pre-con against your pre-con then because yeah i'm just going to use whatever you're playing also yeah it fits into a really comfortable slot right the upsides are great and the downsides aren't that bad so you get to have a deck that is pretty much a workable anywhere. Like I, I'm actually thinking about doing something similar to this for a GP for something like Vegas or Magic Fest because it, it I do there is a weird pressure that's like oh here it comes what's Jim gonna play is it powerful or not and if it's like no this is all about what you guys are doing. I, I was gonna say the same thing like I when you played this and at when we were talking about it I was like I need a deck like this because we're just often in a situation where we're playing with people we've never played with before right and you know. Yeah, we do the thing where we sit down and we say, what's your power level? 110, but that's not an exact science. And, you know, there's plenty of times where it's like, yep, oh, yep, yeah, yeah, we thought that was an eight. That was really a nine or yeah. the, the gap was a little too big and the game wasn't as fun. And this is kind of the type of deck that's just always going to create the right type of situation where at least from your end, you know, you're going to allow everybody to have to have fun and, and be in the game. Right. Absolutely. Well, to the listeners, and I guess this includes you too, Jacob, as you are a listener of the show, uh, we're going to have the deck list for Jacob's deck in the show notes below. It's also below on Game Nights. Make sure you guys watch that episode again. Let us know what you think about this deck. I mean, I think Josh and I are in agreement here that it is a very fun and I think creative way to be able to approach the game of Commander in a way that doesn't have people just immediately sort of be like, oh, great, he's playing, you know x deck there's no way we're going to win or let's all target them first i i do like it and i really like your commander's choices as well if you guys maybe have other suggestions for what you might do for partner commanders let us know in the comments below jacob how do you how does your play group uh um approach playing against the deck so you play with it sounds like people that you know it's it's a tight enough group that people know each other's decks Mm -hmm. so when you pull out this deck what's you know what is what type of strategies do they use against you um, honestly, they, I'll tell you this, they, they play a lot different than you guys do. Um, cause they, I will say they kind of play unafraid. It's not even that they uh. don't do a good threat assessment. They're like, okay, well, you're going to clone my stuff. So I'm going to give you, choose what you want. And then I'll try to overrun you no matter what. Um, so they'll definitely try to remove some of my stuff. Um, you know, but they're, right. they're definitely not strategic about letting me have the things. 
and try to play nice and eventually I, i've definitely been teamed up a couple times i think that's the thing is they'll definitely team up um, uh-huh. a, a, a heck of a lot more you know and just try to take me down as, as soon as they can so it's a little bit of an arms race then, right? Like, you take this thing, sure, but next turn I'm going to play something even better. And if you can't copy that, then, well, you're out of luck. Yes. <laughs> Jimmy and I had the total opposite reaction. It didn't make the episode, but we had a lot of discussion of, like, I'm going to chump block with this thing so that he won't have a chance yeah, to clone it. Yeah, you can't it. clone yeah. this anymore, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, I use the ETB already, and I don't want him to have it. And us, like, well... I'm not even going to play this because what if he clones <laughs> it? Like, we'll play something else that I don't care if he clones. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it's cool. That That's another, another reason why the deck is cool because yep. it creates so many decision points for your opponents, opponents. to think about. Yeah, 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 totally. All right. Well, if this deck sounds awesome to you and you're going to do like Jimmy and I are and maybe build a version of it yourself, mm-hmm. go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and use that affiliate link when you're ordering your magic cards because you're going to get those cards anyway. You may as well simultaneously be supporting Game Nights, Extra Turns, this podcast, and all of our content while you do it. It really does help the show a lot. We super appreciate everybody. We get messages all the time. We just got one in the email about somebody from, like, Australia that was, like, a little bit skeptical but tried it because, you know, they've heard us talk about it a lot and got their cards mega fast and was super surprised about it. From America to Australia. And international shipping, we know we've done it before. Sometimes it can take forever. But Car Kingdom, on top of it. And some of the best customer service I've ever had in my life, hands down across every single spectrum of life and business. So cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Of course, also, you can buy some Ultra Pro products while you are there or at your local game store to bling out your deck. The Mana Vault sleeves that Jacob had during the Game Nights uh, episode are from Ultra Pro. A lot of people talk about those. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. So make sure you guys check out Ultra Pro when well, next time you are shopping for some product to bling out your playmats, your your style, your steez, whatever you are doing with your decks. All right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Jacob, this is you. You're up. You got a cool end step? Yeah, thought about it a little bit. Um, my significant other and I have a problem where we like to play together and we like to feel like we're working together, but we don't mm. like co-op games at home. Ah, so interesting. A That's a conundrum. Cool, yeah. Uh, listen, so a cool board <laughs> game that we found um, is called Arcadia Quest. Um, it's by Cool Mini or Not. Um, I love games where you're like throwing dice and you have random effects. But it does this cool thing where it's almost like you take an RPG and you put it into a tabletop so you can um, go through a campaign, like a small version of a campaign, mm-hmm. fight different monsters, and you each take control of a guild of three heroes that have different abilities. Ah. They have like tons of expansions and stuff. I would recommend if you're gonna start with it, start with the base Arcadia Quest game because it has less rules and less extra effects and things like that. Um, but it's just, one of, it's just one of those games that I really love to play. Um, even if you just, you can go in and customize the levels and everything like that, it's really fun. So if That's I could talk cool. about it forever. I love board games. I'm always down to check out ones that are new and fresh. And this sounds like a lot of fun collaborating without getting into arguments, right? Is it what I'm assuming? (laughs) How long does it take to go through like one session? Um, I say once you get, once you learn the rules, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour. Set up is maybe like five to 10 minutes. Shorter than the commander game, that is for sure. (laughs) Much shorter than the commander game in The cool part about it is you're racing to complete the goal. So it's, you may like help each other take down a monster or take down the boss monster or whatever. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to race and beat you and complete the quest before you. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, I love that. It's I, a little I bit co-op, a little bit yeah, yeah, head-to-head. Yeah. I like so that. So, you have your own goals as well, but you guys are still trying to win together, which is great. Yes, and one of the goals is also take out one member of the guild. So, there's like a respawn oh. system and everything. So, sometimes it does get a little cutthroat where she may like snipe me down a hall with her mage or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, yeah, make sure you guys check that out, Arcadia Quest online. All right. Well, Jacob, you know... I. I'm really grateful that you came on to the show. I'm so glad that you decided to take the time and audition. Um, it's given us the inspiration to do it again. Again, only patrons can audition for the show. We have all the details up on that Patreon page for those of you interested. Um, you really, you came in, you brought it, you had all of the stage presence and magnanimity, however that, you were a magnanimous fellow and it was great to be able to hang out with you and play games. And now, of course, podcast with you on the Command Zone podcast. So do you actually have any uh, words of advice to uh, or tips oh, yeah. for, for anyone for out there? For would-be auditioners out there, Jacob, do you have anything, any advice? Um, I'll say this. Uh, a, never say never. B, um, do a lot of takes. I think, and I still have it on my phone, I think I did like 
12 or 13 different takes. You chose uh, the right one. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, <absolutely. laughs> and I just kept going through. I was like, okay. And I just had like, okay, these are the things that I want. I didn't have a hard script. Um, Cause as you guys probably know by now, I like to talk. So, right. um, but yeah, so I just like, okay, these are the points that I want to hit. This is the, the time that you guys gave me. I'm going to try to hit as many points as I can in that time. And I was like, okay, the first ones obviously were over. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to run it again. I'm going to run it again. I'm going to run it again. And I just kept doing it until I felt, you know, that I was happy with what I have. Um, right. You know, I, Do you that's, ha- that's all I got to say. I just, I just sat down on the couch. I was like, I'm going to be me and just be really happy about magic. And I hope I get on the show. And Wow! When I saw myself getting on the show, I lost my mind. Oh yeah, I think oh, yeah, we have clip. that video. Yeah, we, fact, we can we'll, play it. We'll play it right here. It's one of my favorite pieces of internet content, and I've been on the internet for a while. So <laughs> you had the perfect reaction. <laughs> yeah. Um, one last thing: Do you have any advice for the eventual winner that we choose? So ah. there's going to be some time between now when you're seeing this episode and when we choose the audition winner. But the audition winner could come back and listen to the advice. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any anything to say, Jacob, about being on the show? Um. Yeah, actually, now that I've been on the show and I've met you guys, um, A, Josh and Jimmy are just as cool in real life as they are on the podcast. Thank um, you. You know, Much they're just down to earth, cool people. It was, yeah, for real, it was great hanging with you guys. Um, B, when you guys go to record, it is work. Just be <laughs> ready for a long session of work. Um, stay on your A game, get you some sleep. If you can uh, be well rested, ready to go, um, because the actual recording process that it was it was eye opening at how much goes into it, and I understand. I think ours was like what like four hours for the, the game actual recording. Was, yeah, game, yeah. And but then the day was like I think it was eleven or twelve 11 hour day. Twelve, yeah, with interviews yeah, and all it, that it, stuff too. Yeah, I, d- I definitely left that day and I was drained. <laughs> yeah. We've seen it happen to guests on the show before, but you know, you did an amazing job on the show. Again, please check out the episode if you haven't already, because that could be you sitting across the table from us next time. Um, Jacob, I great advice about the audition. I can't stress enough that iteration is very important. In the same way you would play test the deck a bunch before you finalize it. Yep. You're gonna to wanna to do that with your auditions as well. So don't be afraid to take more takes uh, and find your genuine amazing self in there somewhere. Cause that's why we picked you, Jacob. Uh, and that's why we liked it. Yeah, you audition so much. And some other people who are genuine and sincere, and you mm-hmm. should check out, are our good friends Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman from the Masters of Modern podcast. Yes, sir. They talk about the modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find Alex and Ben and their podcast uh, at Collected.Company right next to us. They're on iTunes and all the normal podcast apps. They also do videos now. If you go to YouTube and just type in Masters of Modern, they will pop up. Mm-hmm. And you can find them on Twitter at the MMCast. And our editor is Josh Murphy. Uh, also... Ashlyn Rose sometimes. Ah. I'm not sure who's going to be editing this one. We're in one of those transition periods where multiple people are working on the podcast. So Ashlyn and Murph, good job. I mean, Murph. We got Ashlyn. Ashlyn. I don't know. There's, okay. <laughs> Your good friend, Ashlyn Originally Rose. Originally, Josh Lee. <laughs> and Jimmy edited one episode a long time ago. All right. <laughs> Special thanks to Jeffrey Bomber. He does the living card animations you find behind us on set, as well as the intros and the outros of our show at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. You can find him on Twitter at living cards, MTG and Jacob, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jacob Holloway. That's with an O and the fourth I V the fourth I V. Very nice. Are you the fourth? Jacob Holloway? It would be yes, weird if I am. Himself, and a long yeah. line of Jacobs and Miss Mail and a lot of other stuff. <laughs> well, you are the first Jacob to be on Game Nights. You're probably the first n- Jacob uh, in your family that got knighted. Yes. Jacob that is Holloway. true. The you first are Sir now Jacob. Sir Jacob the first. <laughs> it's official. Better yeah, put some dude, respect it's, it's, on my name. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Lord <laughs> of Columbus. <laughs> Sir Jacob Holloway. (laughs) Only one may stand. All right, that wraps it up for this podcast episode. Thank you all for listening, and we shall see you next time. Peace. Bye. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. C.
See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>